everyone, Kuro the Artist here, and welcome back to another Ben 10 Breakdown. Alien Force Season 2 started off with such a bang that it gave me a hype to do these breakdowns that I haven't felt since starting Classic. We were introduced to so many new concepts and powers that made every episode thrilling, and we know it all leads up to one of the best two-part finales of the entire franchise. But after such a strong start and awaiting such a strong ending, what happens in between? Well, not much. It's very common for animated shows to have a dip in quality between major events, and we've hit that dip pretty hard with this collection of stories. Now, I personally love Alien Force's first two seasons, and I agree with the common notion that these seasons are what's considered to be one of the peaks of Ben 10. But to class these seasons as flawless would be turning a blind eye to some of the duds. And when going off of airing order, these duds gravitate towards each other and create a cluster of stories that create a rough mid-season to get through. After releasing my video saying Alien Force Season 2 was next level, I still completely stand by all of my statements there. It's just quite a bummer that these episodes draw out the hype a little bit too long between the beginning and the end of this season. But these ones just don't make the cut on why Alien Force Seasons 1 and 2 receive such high praise. If this is your first breakdown and you're curious about how my rating system works, there's a detailed description down below along with a link to all of my previous breakdowns. But by all means, watch this video first I'm sure you'll still enjoy yourself. But first, I want to bring attention to the five-year anniversary celebration of 5YL. On its true anniversary, April 3rd of this year, the 5YL recalibrated event will begin by releasing the first three chapters on my website. For more information on what 5YL R even is, please check out the links below. Then the next day, on April 4th, we will be having a celebration stream with the entire Ink Tank, as well as Nicholas Andrew Louie and Paxton Lee, the voices of Danny and Ben from 5YL. YL, the motion comic. There will be a live script reading, a brief interview, and then we will have a raffle with some games. But on top of all that, we will be having another fan art contest, which you can read the rules here, or you can go on our Twitter at It's the Ink Tank for more information. On March 23rd, 2009, Stan Berkowitz's episode Birds of a Feather had premiered on Cartoon Network. A con artist named Simeon pretends to be a prince that wants to steal a crystal to prove his worthiness as king, with the crystal currently residing in a temple on the moon. The crystal turns out to be a power source for Earth's interstellar communication system, and Simeon was on a mission to steal it, courtesy of the hybrid. Another day for the trio. There it is up ahead. You know, usually their moving backgrounds are the static paintings that shift from the sides of the frame. These are actually animated, like frame by frame, drawn to scroll across. <laughs> Pretty cool how the dots appear before they jump on out. Surprised they were able to wait this quietly and patiently. Usually these things are just always going <laughs> for no freaking reason. But I actually paused on a really nice in between. <laughs> Ooh, all this animation's pretty good. Yeah, a lot of the dynamic shots are very pushed in this episode. Must be a very daring storyboard artist. I'm liking it. Little mana explosion. Haven't seen something like this before. With the lightning cracks as well. Good shit. Yeah, it's just like the opening for good copy, bad copy. The animation and action is just all top tier in this opening scene. Oh shit, I forgot to turn on my light. DNA aliens kind of freeze in the air when they shoot though. Yeah, even this angle too. I don't know, something about this scene. How many scenes like this are boarded like this in Alien Force? Have you ever seen the Omnitrix start sideways and then him twist it into a regular position? Ah, yes. Spider Monkey was the first one to get two distinct transformations. First one was last season in Be Knighted. We zoom into the skull and out. The hands are in a fixed camera angle and then only shift slightly over as they regrow. And then the tail pops into its own frame. Now we got our second one. You can faintly see Ben's facial features sometimes. Starts with dark green shadows that are faded into a pure black as he spins in. I think this frame is supposed to mimic one of those evolutionary charts you see. But we get a much more detailed detailed skeleton as his tail swings into action. It doesn't even grow out, it's like it's already there and the camera just pans down to emphasize it. We do get a very primate uh, shifted skull here, but Spider Monkey doesn't even have this shape of face when the transformation is done, so it's strange to see it morph to this shape for kind of no reason. This arm animation though of it like panning out and splitting as it goes down into two, that is pretty cool. Yeah, it feels like this transformation has more energy than the other one, but the other one just makes better sense for Spider Monkey. Now that was a solid move. 
moving crazy fast too. Might even be Ben's second fastest alien currently next to Jet Ray. It's interesting how these splats are whipping out so fast and creating impacts that causes these splatters. Usually when they impact, they just stick there like goo. <laughs> So I do want to note that it is obviously Ben right here. You can see the Omnitrix symbol taking out like a good seven or eight of these DNA aliens in one go. Just point that out because you'll see. Reinforcements coming in. We're still focused on Ben's spider monkey now. Doing some crazy dodging. I don't remember the animation being this solid in this episode. There's Simeon. You can mostly tell it by his eyes, but he also is a slightly lighter coat than spider monkey. <laughs> So amazing, wonderful shot. But he's coming down while doing this in the air. Yet they're all on the ground over here. So you'd think he like landed and he's just digging them through, causing them to fly up, right? But then you see him land and they all fall down as if they were in the air. But whatever, it looks cool. Just don't think about it. Simeon coming in to save the day. Damn, that is a cool kick though. See, Simeon's actually pretty badass in this episode. Look how he pivots his foot around for a better stance when he lands. I've never seen you fight like that. I mean, you gotta give Ben credit. Simeon's definitely a better martial artist than Ben, but Ben could easily take on the same amount of DNA aliens, and some of his transformations could probably do it even faster. Yeah, so Simeon's a lighter shade, he doesn't have stripes on his tail, and he's got pupils while Ben does. He, he does, he also has got pupils, but they're much larger. <laughs> Ben? So that kind of makes it seem like they can't understand each other when they do for the rest of the episode. Simeon should not be this tall. Tell me this isn't going to be one of those evil twin things again. If she didn't bring it up, I would have. Are you all right? See, now he's speaking straight English. Unless Ben can understand him because of the Omnitrix. But I swear, later on, Gwen and Kevin just randomly start being able to understand him too. So this scene right here. I've seen you fight like that. <laughs> just doesn't really make any sense, does it? I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I feel like I'm picking up the wrong vibes from that. We saw a fellow arachnid chimp in trouble and did what any of us would have done. So Simeon right here is voiced by Diedrich Bader. Sorry if I butchered that at all. He's got quite the resume uh, in both live action and voice work, but, but I like to think of him as Batman from The Brave and the Bold and Harley Quinn. You're the famous Ben Tennyson, aren't you? You've never heard of DNA aliens. No, oh, and I'm sorry. I've got something important I have to do. You're everything they say you are. I know he's playing Ben and this is all an act, but I still prefer this Simeon over his flanderized version in Ultimate Alien and then Omniverse. Because here he's like cunning and mysterious and tricky. Well, in the others, he's just like, you know, Argit, but an arachnid gym. It's not important. I'll find it myself. Yeah, the backgrounds are so damn dark. If it wasn't for Simeon being able to interact with his surroundings, I would have no idea what I'm looking at. He's just kind of swinging into a black abyss. It's almost like that scene in Far From Home when Peter's Tingle is helping him fight through Mysterio's drones. It's what Simeon's got going on right now. Back at Ben's room. We see his house a lot more than I remember. I guess it's just been so long since I really ran through Alien Force because he still is treated more or less like as an actual high school student. Whereas by Omniverse, Ben just doesn't give a shit about school at all. How come you haven't asked me what this is? Because the scene just started. I'm worried about the spider monkey. So even though Simi addressed himself as an arachnid chip right to Ben, he still chooses to call him as a spider monkey. While one could say Ben cares more about labeling the transformations as his silly names than enough to learn their species, I actually think that plays into his philosophy that all of his transformations are real beings. And to him, it makes sense to classify them by his chosen names because it helps him identify with them as individuals. Gwen's got another burger barn cup. So far, we're seeing their merch more than the actual location. What's that, Kevin? I'm trying to figure out what it does. So Kevin doesn't even know what it does. He's just dogging on Ben for not being curious, not because he wants to show off his usual library of alien tech. Grandpa used something like this to clean his ears, and boric acid solution comes... Oh, Lord. How does it stop at the earwax and not burn your ears? What did she say this was? Boric acid solution comes... Boric acid solution? Well, I'll be damned. Boric acid is real. It's an antiseptic flame retardant neutron absorber. Yeah, it's it's basically just straight up acid. Well, it's a little more complicated than that, but I mean, if you want the nitty gritty, just Google it like I'm doing right now. But that's neat. Real science. Yes, the DNA aliens use stronger acid. Okay, well, there that answers my question then. So it's very potent boric acid. <laughs> Simeon is so friggin' cool. Is he firing real bullets and not the laser guns from Save the Last Dance? <laughs> Always love seeing me some goop. Although no eyes, Omnitrix symbol, or a gravity projector. And there's a 
ton of goop. Goop seemed to only have like one fourth of his mass in the last episode undercover. Now he seems to have like three times. Well, I guess it makes sense that he could regenerate his own goop because he fires it off to shoot it as an acidic attack. And if he couldn't replenish that slime, then he would just exert himself to oblivion. I need some equipment. That's called stealing. Oh no, they are firing the laser guns. But I swear they were blue in the last episode. I just thought that the red meant that it was like muzzle flashes or something. <laughs> Pretty neat solution, but still, no Omnitrix or UFO. My name is Prince Simeon, being the arachnachimps against an army of aliens. I can't tell what these things are supposed to be, though. I thought they were arachnachimps until it panned over and actually showed the arachnachimps. I don't know, they actually kind of looked like the poachers that Ryan drew in uh, and beyond. Till he saw a light coming from a cave. Inside, he found a crystal. Alright, so because of copyright, I can't keep all of his speech in there. But basically, one of the arachnachimps found this crystal that led to a secret tunnel, allowing them to get the drop on these guys. Jeffred was crowned king of Arachna. Oh, the shadows even got a crown on it now. The crystal disappeared. People thought it was a sign I didn't deserve to be king. Man, this is actually a much more interesting story if it was real and not just a bunch of Simeon's bullshit, but maybe that's the point. I'm gonna get that crystal back. Prove that I am worthy, hidden in a fortress. See, if I was Ben, I would be like, if the crystal disappeared, how did you know it's in a fortress and how to get there in the first place? It's already a giant hole in the story. Let me help you. But you don't even know this guy! And what do you get out of helping him? Alright, so neither Gwen or Kevin would have had a problem with this in any other episode, but all all of a sudden right now they're just trying to play devil's advocate for Simeon so that Ben's character has the opportunity to defend why this is a good idea but we don't need any of this. Gwen and Kevin should easily be on board for this. I don't get why they're opposed. He's just a kid. He's just like me. You shouldn't be going off on your own with someone we don't know. Maybe they're just a little paranoid from the Albedo incident but I don't know this this doesn't make sense to me. Where's the fortress? On the moon. No, oh, I love this ship design. It's very different from what we normally see. Although it's coming up vertical here and then the camera changes and it's horizontal. Kind of looks like a sideways drone if you think about it. When I'm in the suit, I won't be able to use the Omnitrix. Why wouldn't he be able to use the Omnitrix in the suit? I'm pretty sure we see him using it wearing the plumber suit. They're not even going to explain it, are they? Craziest thing we've ever done. They both had a lot of responsibility thrown at them. So yeah, I get that they want to build this parallel between Ben and Simeon's situation. But by using Gwen and Kevin to be the antithesis of this idea, it doesn't do anything for the story and just makes them seem out of character. I don't see why they need someone arguing against this standpoint anyways. Ben's story can relate to Simeon's story without someone else trying to say it doesn't just so that they can reinforce it does. You hear that? What? Ah, I forgot. Your hearing's not as good as ours. Arachnachimps have super hearing. That would be dope if that ever became relevant. Like Ben's gotta do a secret spying mission and he turns into Spider Monkey to listen in. Spider Monkey would make the perfect ninja too. Pretty sure I drew a commission very similar with like an arachnachimp uh, warrior or something. You can do this. I'll show them. I'll show them all. Ben just unlocked the villain ending. <laughs> Wait, this thing is CG. If it wasn't for this smooth turn, I would never tell. They really got a handle on their flat rendering. Also, now that they're sideways, doesn't that change how they're standing inside? What are we supposed to do with the extra arms? Makes sense since they're arachnid simian suits. I could probably dodge them. I couldn't. What do you mean, dude? Forget everything else. Let's just focus on this episode. Remember at the beginning? <laughs> You could absolutely dodge those, Ben. Come on. My powers are useless unless I can touch something. Yeah, Kevin's power limitations make sense. But even for Ben, if that was true, they could have him transform into, like, let's say Big Chill while they're still on the ship. Take the suit, throw it in a backpack, have Big Chill phase into the building, and then when he turns back to Ben, put the suit on. It's like they want this to be harder on themselves than it has to be. We got that classic UAF red and silver color scheme for a device. Oh, as well as the ear cleaner, too. Didn't point that one out yet. Again, so much lovely animation in this episode. A lot of the really good animation seems to be in the most mediocre stories. Maybe they do that on purpose to make up for it, but like a lot of the episodes I feel like had a really solid story and plot. Don't have animation as good as this, but on the flip side, this episode is what you can easily chalk up to filler, and it looks ballin'. <laughs> Also, Gwen's powers are clearly able to be used within this suit, yet the hazmat suits from the original series used to give her issues. She just wiped all those out by herself. See, they seem surprised that she can even do this, but I'm surprised why she doesn't always do this. Also made me realize within that suit, she's gotta put two fingers in each finger hole. That's gotta feel weird as shit. Kevin looking hella thin right here. 
What now? Ben could use Humongous Aura, destroy them all, use Swamp Fire and blow them all up and trap them in vines, use Echo Echo to shatter them, use Big Chill to freeze all of them, use Chroma Stone to absorb their lasers and shoot them back at them, use them. Or Kevin. Look at this pretty cool, like, 180 style camera shot. Takes out two backhanded without even looking at it. Are these things dangerous or not? You know, before Simeon even helps, Ben's resisting this whole pressure on his own. That's some hardcore tennis and strength right there. Booty shaking Ben over here. This is a ton of shit to be falling out. He's got two cards and some change. Get a wallet, dude. What's this handle? Is this the handle that Kevin ripped off of the door at the beginning of the episode? Some keys, too. <laughs> The thing doesn't immediately drop as long as one of them's holding on to it, and an arachnid chimp is obviously much stronger than Ben. So if Ben dropped it for a second to hit Humongousaur, I'm, I'm just saying. Where'd you get the DNA alien resin remover? Long story. Oh, I didn't catch that as a kid. But since Simeon said he never heard of them, he shouldn't know what that is. <laughs> But now we get to meet Lou, who actually returns him of all characters in Cosmic Destruction when Albedo gets stranded on the moon. This could not get any worse. Oh! Ow! Ah! But check out this desk, though. How's he get in and out? Why me? Why me? He's like, oh shit, now I actually have to work for a living? Testing! You have to leave! I'm serious! Oh, Lou. Keep trying your best. <laughs> to fix that! Oh, Ben 10 character acknowledging property damage? That's rare. That was an Omnitrix sound effect. Right there. I swear that's used in the classic series a lot. Oh, that's how he exits. Hey, it's neat that he appears with a cold aura. Like his presence is so cold it starts cool in the air. Man, this ice does not look fun to draw. You know, for a base with a plethora of army drones, you'd think there'd be some inside of here. Or at least they'd be able to upgrade Lou with some weaponry if what he's protecting is so important. This guy needs to chill out. I think I hate puns. Did Big Chill just say that? Big Chill, the alien mostly known for his cold puns, just said, I think I hate puns. Uh... <laughs> Oh, that's cool. He knows Jet Ray's faster, so he swaps in. You even see him shrink down into Jet Ray for the size difference. Big Chill's torso is a little dark, though. And then he catches Lou for a swift glide. What's going on here? You first. You know, this temple thing looks like the Helix from Omniverse. Wait, what happened to his jacket? I'm gonna go out on a limb here and guess that there was a cutscene where for whatever reason he had to give Lou his jacket, maybe even just to comfort him. But don't quote me on that as fact, I, I have no fucking clue. <laughs> Love whenever they do the bubbles fade into the background thing. <laughs> Although if at this point in the story Ben knows Simeon is playing him, I wouldn't be taking the crystal out until I confronted him about that. <laughs> Had to put it in here just in case. All right, but where'd he get this? Did he quite literally pull this out of his ass too? That guard, he was just doing his job, but you were going to kill him. It's nice to see Ben have this amount of sympathy, but I mean, the same could be said for the Dean aliens and they're getting the shit beat out of them every episode. All I ever wanted to do was lead. That sounded a little pat. Wait, a little pat? It's a pretty uncommon word for someone who used to give his future self shit for using the word thus. Ah, I made up all that stuff. Which is disappointing. This place really is intergalactic communication. All right, so Simeon destroyed interstellar communication, so no one can call for help with the hybrid invade. I love how even this ties into the overall hybrid arc, and I totally forgot that Simeon was working for the hybrid to begin with. <laughs> Yeah, say what you want about this episode, but the animation is pretty good throughout the whole thing. Who's Lou? I saved his life and he told me what was really going on. Yeah, alright, so maybe that all happened in the scene that was cut from the episode where Ben gave him his jacket for whatever reason. I'm just saying, Ben shows up without his jacket and he never gets it back. Kind of forgot to point this out in Alone Together, but same thing happens. Ben gives his jacket to Ryan and he comes back without his jacket, so maybe he's got a bunch of backup jackets. They just keep on printing them. Sorry, suspicious when Simeon knew what the DNA alien ear cleaner was. And he he doesn't have this. The old switcheroo. So he's landed in a desert. Is this Lost Soledad? Sounds like you made a real monkey out of him. Since when are hybrids capable of humor? Offend me all you want, as long as you keep paying me like this. That would make a pretty good Tinder bio. A hybrid with only three eyes on his head. That's pretty neat. It's the ear cleaner. It's a mistake. Oh, he's actually showing some genuine fear. Do you think Simeon could take on this hybrid? Maybe you need to have your ears cleaned. <laughs> 
All right, so if they dropped that super strong acid into his ear, it probably burned him from inside his skull. I thought they genuinely killed Simeon off in this episode, and that would have made a crazy ending. It probably would have been great, not just because haha -ha putting death in Ben 10 makes it cooler and darker and grittier and all that shit. It just wraps things up nicely here, at least in my opinion, especially because when he shows back up, he's like 10 times more annoying. You know, despite season two starting off with a bang, these middle episodes are starting to drop a bit in quality. So I'm going to start off by giving the plot of this episode of two. Seems like season two is really rolling through all of the typical tropes a TV show pretty much feels indirectly obliged to do. And now we're on the whole meet a character, go through a whole dungeon, they betray you at the last minute sort of thing. And this episode was mediocre at best. I almost gave it a one, but this episode wasn't done horribly. It just kind of felt very bland, especially in comparison to the absolute bangers we got with like Alone Together, Dark Star Rising, and Good Copy, Bad Copy. Simeon could have been a pretty neat character in this episode to give a dynamic to, but it's like it started off with Ben trying to relate to Simeon, and while that got Ben on board, it didn't really have a resolution or payoff. I felt like it was building up to some type of narrative that would come full circle, but it was like, nope. So it almost made that argument seem pointless. Like in any other episode, it's not like Kevin and Gwen wouldn't have helped them out. They're all pretty open to helping anybody who needs help, because if it was really about helping strangers, as Gwen put it, they wouldn't have helped any of the plumber's kids that they've met so far, because they're all also strangers. And yeah, Simeon ended up being a bad guy, which is why they probably wrote the characters this way, to try to steer away from that reveal to make it more impactful. It just doesn't make any sense to me. And running through the whole buildings and traps, you know, closing walls, bunch of robots with lasers, we've seen it all before. I really hate using the word filler, but this episode really is kind of filler. So yeah, a two because it's not like this episode was horrible, it's just nothing special, and really puts a dent on the hype that season two was building so far. Characterization, it's gonna get another two. Just because Simeon was a lot better in this episode than his future appearances doesn't mean he was fantastic here. He's just better comparatively, but he's still kind of just generic in this episode. I really do feel like if he actually was a prince and all of that in this whole thing, he would have been a much better character. They put all that effort into that backstory for nothing. And the way Simeon reacted to it, like I get he was lying, but he was very convincing. In fact, all of that could have been true and he could still be working for the hybrid. It just seems like they threw all of that out for the sake of the twist. They could have had the best of both worlds. Ben was all right in this episode, and I like that he was still figuring everything out, but a lot of this episode was just them going from point A to B. And you know, I already touched on Kevin and Gwen being irrational in this episode, just to be the antithesis of Ben's stance. Visuals, I will give it a four though. The animation is fantastic, and that almost made me want to give it a five. Ben meeting another one of his alien forms is always neat to see, not to mention that we got a decent amount of transformations in this episode. But despite the animation really being up there, it still doesn't quite live up to being a 5. In importance, it's gonna get a 1. Now, an argument can be made for this being a 0, which I pretty much agree, but similar to how I ranked the Forever Knights in the classic series, where technically you can skip all of their episodes and still understand their narrative in the negative 10. But the more Forever Nights episodes you watch, the more it adds on to the plot line, the more it makes the final resolution seem like it has weight to it. And it's the same with this one. It might as well be a zero, but on the off chance you do watch it, it does solidify that the hybrid are scheming and really have thought a lot of things through in their conquest to invade Earth, like taking out their intergalactic communications. I just think if you watch the finale with that notion that they tried to prevent something like that, it does make their scheme seem more well thought out. But aside from it just being another brick in the story arc, you can very well skip this episode. And entertaining, I'll give it a three. It's passable, it can be rewatchable, but it's not exciting or extravagant. It's like, yeah, this is another episode of Ben 10. So that leaves this off at a 12 out of 25. Season two's really taken a dip. Let's see if some of the future episodes can save it. Jim Krieg's episode Grounded had first aired November 3rd, 2008. After Ben's parents witness him transforming into an alien to fight the hybrid, they confront Ben about his black eye and catch him in a lie. His parents then try to prevent Ben from leaving the house since he's broken their trust, leaving Gwen and Kevin to fight the Dean aliens on their own. He's such a good boy. He's a great boy! Love seeing some positive encouragement from parents. A lot of shows like to write them as the enemy, but you know, don't see a lot of strong families these days. Allowing a child to explore the wholeness of his entire being. Also pretty common knowledge by now, but the voices of Ben's parents in Alien Force onward are the same ones that appeared in Race Against Time. And in Alien Force right here, they're even modeled after the same people, unlike the classic series, which kind of did its own thing. But this was produced after Race Against Time, so they had that reference in. Race Against Time was at least originally written to be canon. Or not, 
not, I don't know, it, it's just kind of a gray area. Point is, we're looking at Beth Littleford and Dom McManus right here. Ooh, shaky cam, the orange lighting, really great turn. Who the hell animated this? Good shit. Oh man, this is beautiful. It's not even like this episode is more detailed, they're just being more precise with their shading. A little goes a long way. Ben? I actually think it's really cool they're starting the episode off from the parents' POV. Make something we've seen many times before, the trio fighting an alien, have a fresher feel to it. Now it almost seems more dangerous. Fire. It's a little anticlimactic of him just standing there with a gentle gesture. Normally he's like, Swamp Fire. You know what I'm saying? But either way, it's my boy. Always love seeing Swamp Fire. Ben? <laughs> Hey, what a freaking kick. I like to think that Ben realizes he needs this much momentum to knock a hybrid over after fighting them with a few mugs or long and basically always being matched in strength. Still reeling from the augmented power of my new form, no doubt. So this hybrid saying he's been augmented, which in a way goes against his whole purity complex. Oh yeah, I guess he does look a little bit different. He's got like these shoulder spikes going on right here. <laughs> Now we've seen Hybrid flash these wings before, but have we actually seen them fly with them? I don't think so. At least I can't remember. The Hybrid gave you a black eye. So this calls back to the pilot where Ben discovers that any damage he takes in alien form also relates to his human form. Humongosaur skinned his knee. It was still skinned when I turned back. Which practically never comes up. I think this is like the only other example, but correct me if I'm wrong. I'm talking just straight Omnitrix and Alien Force. Like I know about the whole clockwork thing and Ultimate Alien and so forth. But the hybrid did say he was augmented, and unless I'm reading too much into that line, it makes sense that he'd be the first one to actually do some legit damage to Ben. Where have you been? Young man. I got in a little fight. Are you sure it was a kid at school? And not a giant alien creature? Well, I mean, that's one way to bring it up. Grandpa Max said we each have a dad. I should have known. That's so typical. Doesn't matter the continuity. Ben's dad always has issues with Grandpa Max. And it makes sense, though. You know, Grandpa Max was a great guy to the kids, but you can tell he was kind of neglectful of his own. Your Uncle Frank and I knew he had some other life. We knew. And that he lied to us about it all the time. I won't have you lying, too. Yeah, I just really like that Frank was, like, picking up on Grandpa Max's scheming, too. Although he kind of was the same way in race against time, but he was more positively supportive of it then. You know about Wildman? I'm surprised what I know about Ben. Whereas here he's just pissed. But I guess he's just pissed because his son's also starting to lie to him now and he's starting to see this pattern. Man, am I really defending Carl right now? Kid me would have just been like, calm down, dad. But now I get it. It's our own fault. We were too permissive. Now they're trying to reflect on their consequences of being carefree. All good ways to handle it. This isn't just a straight up, we're mad at you for lying, Ben. They're like really laying over all the complications of this situation. The Omnitrix is attached to me. It doesn't come off. It's coming off all right. It's not coming off. Y'all probably heard this rant from me a million times, but it's always better when it seems like the Omnitrix is irremovable and doesn't slide off like a wristwatch like it does later on. Not a scratch. Sorry about your saw blades. Perhaps he should have used a screwdriver. You're forbidden from using the Omnitrix. Oh, this is a new location. Said he'd call back. Look at this. A lot of lorem ipsum happening over here. This one's literally just the word symbol. This, that, that's actually kind of funny. Bringing in goods and shipping out local products is an unregistered tanker from the tiny island of Castoon. Where they used to do nuclear testing. See, when I was a kid, all of this, like, discovery shit went over my head. I don't know if I was just, like, ignorant to it or I didn't care. But during this rewatch, I really see how deep, like, the hybrid have been planning. Makes me want to give all the episodes that have stuff like this a five in importance, but, like, that just ain't fair. But still, it's something to appreciate. Like, they really are trying to make every episode connect to it in some way, if they can. And on top of that, make the hybrid's plan seem very intricate. <laughs> I love how Gwen takes a stance first and then just starts running anyways. Oh, we got a problem! Does Kevin have a cell phone now or is he using Gwen's? Phone call for Mr. Roguish Charm. I don't have a cell. Also, strange they're not using their plumber's badges to communicate. I've gotta go help Gwen with an after school project. See, this type of lime green. I like this color a lot more for Ben's eyes than it just being a straight basic green that even matches his jacket. This just looks a little more natural to me. <laughs> Get why he's not waiting to transform. He could be booking it halfway down the street before he even thinks to become an Echo Echo. Like, what advantage is he expecting out of turning into Echo Echo right now? He's still gonna have to get there. And Echo Echo isn't exactly a, a mobile transformation. Do you really think we're that gullible? I mean, y'all seem pretty gullible in Race Against Time, not gonna lie. And I get it, non canon, whatever. But it's hard not to make those comparisons when these characters are literally based off of those iterations. And at the time, it was at least more acceptable they were canon. So relax, let me just point shit out. You are grounded. What? <laughs> Not only is this the most like emotional we've heard Echo Echo, but it's also the most expressive we've seen him too. I love when they start messing with his eyes and shit like this. You can't ground 
on me. Up the stairs, young man. Look at that shadow change. Just a random thought, but Ben could probably have sent one of his duplicates out. Do we even have a paddle? I have my hemp belt. That's the Carl we know. Surprised they're even allowed to say hemp in Ben 10. I don't get why he's still Echo Echo, though. Like, we've seen him be able to manually transform back numerous times this season. It's not like he's got to wait it out anymore. Hello? All right, that's hella creative, but it makes you wonder how Ben isn't just straight up destroying his phone in his room right now. And the sound waves are able to travel through the phone. Similar to the stuff we see him doing it alone together, it shows that Echo Echo has much more of a control. Like, he, he manipulates sound. He doesn't just shoot it. He's able to manipulate its properties. Who is this? All right, pink phone. So that means Kevin really does have his own phone now. Are you hanging out with a... Bad crowd. You holding out on us, Benny boy? You ratted me out? I can explain. I thought in what our little girl's made of, we've established that Gwen's parents are cool with her lifestyle. Like, I get there's a difference between her revealing her powers and her going out and saving the world, but you gotta figure they would have known by now. It almost seems impossible that they wouldn't. Vilgax never gave me the mom look. Nah, Vilgax gave you the I'm gonna cut your fucking arm off, kid look. Kevin's on it. You sent Kevin? You know, I get that conceptually. They want to save the big grand team up for the finale, but Ben could also probably start calling in a couple of his favors, like Alan, maybe Julie and Ship can go. He knows Cooper now, too. Does he only have, like, one favor and he doesn't want to blow it? No, usually I like to point out good backgrounds, because Alien Force can be hit or miss with them, and I haven't really for this episode yet, and I feel bad because the background game's really killing it here, too. What stinks in here? If this wouldn't drown me, the amount I'd be throwing up inside of my own lungs would. Great water animation. But isn't this just the same goo that they already encountered in Max Out? See, the whole kitchen layout looks pretty nice, too. Trapped in a vat and conferencing Gwen in. Surprised they're just letting this happen. What's your phone made of? Titanium. Ugh. You know, I want to flack on Kevin for not thinking of that, but he's also the one who said, There's nothing around here for me to touch. Even though there was, like, everything for him to absorb around him. According to Wi-Fi-pedia. Excuse me? According to Wi-Fi-pedia. Yeah, this is in the, the internet is still new and we're gonna be hip type of era. But, like, let's just say some bullshit like Wi-Fi-pedia and it'll sound legit. <laughs> What is guano? The berries on the island are radioactive. When they're eaten by the bats, the resulting waste is the rarest isotope in the world. So the radioactive bat guano is the goop that they marinate their eggs in? Or is this really supposed to be, like, two different forms of goo? Also makes you think, though, Gwen's getting all this info offline. If she was out there in the ground floor on the mission, she wouldn't be able to research all this, so it's kind of good that she stayed back. Maybe they do need a guy in a chair. You found a wireless network. That is the good news. It's like they're doing everything in their power not to use their plumber's badges, which you'd think would be, like, the first thing they would try, even more so than the cell phones. Ladder, ahead on your right. Climb it. Okay, the hatch on your left. Is Kevin carrying this webcam with him? <laughs> Here comes some more. There's a crane hook right there. It's like they don't even dare to show what Ben's seeing right now because they know it don't make sense. Whoa! That was pretty cool. See right here, they got a still frame that they've reused from earlier, but his mouth isn't even synced up. Okay, that was pretty cool. Although, I'm just harping on the shit that I see. Like, y'all know this episode looks beautiful so far. Nice to see you again. Dad, I've gotta go help him. You are not my facing anyone. My facing? See, Ben's questioning her like she's got it all wrong, but I would believe that my face or whatever is the Ben 10 Universe version of the Prime social media, because they did just say Wi-Fi-pedia, so it's clear that they're not really trying to say name brand things. So dramatic zoom on Ben, fade out do some commercial, come back in, and he's not wearing his jacket. This just happened last episode, too. Like, a quick scene change and his jacket disappears. Maybe they're just getting sick of drawing it. I can't obey you now without disobeying everything you've ever taught me about life, the world, and responsibility. That is such a great way to put it. They've been trying to raise him to do the right thing and be a good person, and now he's trying to. And he's just gotta get them to realize it. Aw, oh, don't do it. So unnecessary, man. He's probably just super upset dealing with this bullshit when he's only trying to save the world, but, like, that's still your room, dude. I'll fix that later. No, you won't, dude. You're gonna have to hire a whole crew to replace this wall, the piping, insulation. I love that he's so heavy that even just pulling himself up bends the platform. This stinks. Need to dispose of you. So they're gonna tie him up, hang him from the ceiling, and have a conversation with him before they decide, all right, we gotta dispose of you. That one was a little high and inside. Seems like Humongosaur's voice filter is back. It's been dropped for a few episodes. Plans for the bat poop as a power source. So they're trying to make the goo a power source. All right, so it is completely independent from the goop from Max Out then. So we got the egg marinating goop. We got the power source goop. We got the goop that the DNA aliens shoot out of their mouths. We got goop goop. We got the goop from that Mr. Smoothie cup. Try the cable. Cool. It's neat that Kevin gets these little circuitry patterns when he absorbs it. 
Ooh, when the door opens, you see a reflection that's bright enough to reveal the barrel of Carl's gun right here. That's pretty cool. Good shot, honey. Nice piece, by the way. It's been sitting in the attic ever since Frank and I were kids. Always hate- Do you think him and Frank ever took it out to, like, shoot things in the yard or something? Surprise, whatever it runs on as a power source hasn't died out, or it hasn't run out of ammo either. Maybe Max left it there with the intention of Carl having it just in case. I'm sorry I just blew you off like that. Humongosaurus got his sharp teeth back, too. We've seen you in action. You know what you're doing. <laughs> Oh, what I tell you, out of ammo. He was really afraid of it, though. What's so special about this bazooka? Nice. Yo, how did his parents get on this boat, though? Like, yeah, you could just say they took the bazooka and swam across. Like, like there's a way they got on this boat, but really? They really took this bazooka and swam all the way out there, found exactly where Ben was. It's like, it's quite the stretch. What about the high breed? You're supposed to drag him off the ship before you scuttled it. Must have slipped my mind. Whoops, there I go murdering again. A. I used to hate all that plumber stuff. But now I understand he was only protecting us. I like that once he hangs it up, it's painted like the background texture too. Like this is gonna be permanently part of the scenery. It's your cousin. Been an alien sighting in the desert. Then what are you waiting for? That's pretty awesome though. Bring a jacket! For real though, Ben, where's your jacket? So now Ben's parents know all about his secret identity. For real this time. So I'm gonna start off by giving this one a four. We're still in the middle part of season two after the grand opening, but before the grand ending, and we're mulling our way through the middle plots, but this one was actually done pretty well. Like I say with a lot of the middle ground episodes, it's not that special, but I at least really liked the execution of it. I used to be a little irritated about the irrationality of Ben's parents actually trying to ground him from saving the world, but from their perspective, one, they don't even really understand the scale of how big the hybrid invasion goes. Two, it's been pretty common knowledge that aliens exist for the past five years, so it's not even like aliens are the problem, it's that Ben's fighting them's the problem. There's been people fighting aliens all over the news, the parents probably assume somebody else could handle it. And three, in Carl's perspective specifically, Max has been lying to him his whole life, and Max never actually got the chance to come forward and tell him the truth. And now Carl's starting to see the same patterns happen with Ben, so of course he's going to start acting irrational. But as you can see, once they fully start understanding the gravity of the situation, they do come around and accept Ben for what his responsibilities are, and how big the stakes get, and Ben really is the person that needs to put an end to all of it. It does seem like Gwen was forgotten about halfway through this episode, but this wasn't really her story, and you can kind of imply the same resolution happened, especially because we already had a whole story about Gwen's parents. It's like, this one's really more about the life of the Omnitrix wielder Ben Tennyson. A lot of the stuff with Kevin in this episode was great too. Sure, he got captured in the end, but he wasn't exactly incapable on his own. He's got the skills, he's got the drive, he's got the bravery, he just hasn't quite mastered his powers yet. He hasn't even learned to shapeshift his arms, so it's believable that he wouldn't quite yet be able to hold his own. Characterization, it'll also get a 4. I do kind of wish they played up more of the carefree hippie aspects of Race Against Time, but it also makes sense that it wouldn't work that much here. In Race Against Time, it did very much feel like a crutch in order for Ben's parents to have a personality, whereas here it only seemed like one part of the whole picture. They were also probably a little bit more afraid to really push how far it goes in a cartoon, but I do think Sandra and Carl were very enjoyable characters. They weren't just like antagonists trying to make Ben's life harder. They really did have their own valid motivations for their concerns, and they weren't unreasonable when Ben really broke it down and said, this is my life and my responsibility, and this is what I was brought up to do. It also shows a lot more about what Ben's home life is. It's something that at least I couldn't stop help but wondering. All throughout Alien 4 seasons 1 and 2, if he's realistically a 15-year-old kid in high school, what's his life like outside of fighting aliens? How it affects his family? And also, when it starts affecting his family, how that comes back around and starts affecting his friends. Visuals? Slamming down another four. This episode is beautiful. Anytime people say UAF doesn't have good animation, point them this way. It's not quite a five because, again, the content being animated isn't super exciting like a lot of Ben 10 episodes could be. But the way they presented it was magnificent. And unlike Birds of a Feather, I didn't feel like this episode had a mediocre premise to begin with. So the action that we see, the coloring, the characters, the background, it's all pretty great. Importance that's where it's gonna get a one. I wish this episode was much more important. This would be a great introduction for Ben's parents being supporting characters in the series. Maybe that gun that Carl hung up in the living room comes back into the future at a later plot point. It'd be cool if you see them show up during War of the Worlds, or maybe even an ultimate alien. Turns out Gwen put a protection spell on Ben's house as well, and you get a couple of scenes of Sandra and Carl fighting off the Esoterica. Hell, even a whole episode about Sandra and Carl could have been interesting. Now that Carl understands that all of his speculations about Max was real. He starts retreading his path.
past and trying to look at things from a different perspective. There could have been a whole episode where once they find out Max is alive, that Carl and Max have a resolution together. Hell, Carl probably doesn't even know that Max is dead right now. But it just seems like this episode was the perfect groundwork for making Sandra and Carl interesting, supporting, relevant characters. And then it goes nowhere. And like I said, even though I enjoy how the hybrid plans are integrated in as many episodes as possible, even in very subtle ways like this one, there's not a lot you can take out of here and say, yes, this is necessary to watch War of the Worlds or whatever. Only reason it gets a one is because it pretty much puts to rest the speculation of what do Ben's parents think about Ben fighting aliens or how does he get away with it? It establishes a little bit more of Ben's home life and for enjoyment as a viewer, you do get a little bit out of it. But of course, you can easily skip this episode and there would be no consequence. And lastly, for entertaining, I will finish this off with another four. I think it's very interesting to see Ben trying to deal with how his parents handle him being a hero and especially after finding out that he's been lying about it this whole time. Not to mention the action scenes are pretty great, and it's always nice to see different characters play off of each other outside of the main trio. So that's gonna leave this episode off with a 17 out of 25, but let's keep going and see where we finish things off. On November 21st, 2008, Pet Project had aired, written by Len Uli. The Forever Knights build a flying contraption of weaponry and try to steal Julie's pet ship in order to power it. I don't know if I pointed this out yet, but Alien Force always uses the exact same moon in every background. It will always look like this. You can usually tell because of this star pattern right here, which means the Ben 10 universe always has a full moon, no matter what. The Saiyans be damned. We have lately endured a grave defeat. Joseph Chadwick right here is voiced by Tim Curry. You know, he's been Captain Hook, uh, Dr. Frankenfurter, Nigel Thornberry too, that's him. The villainous dragon escaped from our grasp. All these scenes are from uh, Being Knighted in season one, back when they actually thought that the dragon plotline was going to go anywhere. We must pursue the beast across the void. So they're trying to build something that can destroy the dragon and go after it. A starship. Technologies we have acquired. Literally just a bunch of different machines and stuff slapped together. I do like how a lot of them are all different colors to show it's like miscellaneous pieces of tech. Controls are too complex for human operation. The solution. Wonder how the hell he pulled this off. Maybe magnetism? Galvan shapeshifter. Oh. Oh, they actually went through and built a 3D model of ship. I know when he actually takes control of the ship, that's usually a CG model. I wonder if they built this with the intention of using it more. Because aside from this one shot, I can't think of a reason they'd ever need a CG version of the base form ship. I'll catch a little blob for ya. Sir Morton here is voiced by Kevin Michael Richardson. Julius House, this might be our first appearance of that. <laughs> You know, when Alien Force first came out, I was very disappointed that Julie's subsequent appearances didn't include Ship, so I was kind of convinced he'd never return, or at least wouldn't be Julie's pet, so I'm glad they kept that connection with her and Ship. It's a nice little backyard. Show me a new trick. <laughs> So upgrading the toaster, I believe, but, you know, the toast, I'm sure he probably just saw the bread and tried to create little parts of him that mimic it. But what my issue is, now that the toast has been ejected, does he not need to absorb that extra mass back into him? Or is he blorping a part of him off of himself, similar to how Bazel created him in the first place? And then in that terms, do those blorps become sentient, or can they choose? <laughs> How am I supposed to explain that? Yeah, you're screwed, Julie. Or just ignore it. Gotta go. You ready to shop? Totally ready. <laughs> I want to say we don't normally see Gwen like this, but that's usually because she's always hanging out with Ben and Kevin. But if you think back to Secret of the Omnichick, she does really love shopping and all that too. So it's nice to see her enjoy some of her own personal interests, especially to have a friend to enjoy it with. I'm not hanging around and watching you shop. I mean, it's the mall, dude. Just go find a store that you want to go to. That's okay. You're not invited. Oof. It's neat that Chip can choose to only partially upgrade pieces of tech, like only the back bumper of Kevin's car. And then Ben sent me and I am. Oh, I like this extra highlight that they drew for his car. When my Mind seeing that more. Where is Ben? I asked him to come along. He said he had homework. So Gwen said that Kevin's not invited for this shopping trip. So either Ben was invited and Kevin wasn't, or maybe Julie asked Ben to come for Kevin's sake. But like, I don't get why Ben had to lie though. He probably could have just been like, I'm not feeling it. Julie would understand. Destroy the Earth like female. Growing up in animated TV shows, they always have characters watching like super old movies from the 50s. And I never had that experience. Maybe I just don't know where to get these kind of movies. You know, shit like streaming and easy internet access wasn't a thing. But I was usually watching like sitcoms and stuff. But I wouldn't mind giving these a shot. If y'all have seen some super old movies like this, like, you know, 50s, 60s sci-fi horror, what are some of your favorites? Leave them in the comments. Maybe I'll give them a shot. Man's gonna learn to chew with his mouth closed. 
And now we're back to the Black Abyss. And McDuffie's is having a going out of business sale. One of the shout outs to Dwayne McDuffie's sprinkled throughout the franchise. Rest in peace. <laughs> So in the mirror, we see a bunch of lasers coming down. But here, we only get one that actually impacts the ground. Very random thing, but drawing people from this angle and making it look good, and on top of that, animating a turn like this too, that's some shit I personally struggle with, so I'm always amazed when people pull it off. And of course, some UAF tech is red and silver. Is this the first time we see their, like, flying horse things? Watch the paint! That's four coats! Oh, and the drop highlight is back. That was kind of dropped in the earlier episodes. Although I can't tell if Kevin's trying to get them to watch out for his car or if it was actually damaged. Does that, does that count as a Kevin's car counter? Yeah, it seems like they're always just missing the car. Gwen's phone looks a lot rounder than it did in the last episode. The shield too, I'm pretty sure that's new. I don't get why this has to be red and silver though. Ben, Ellsworth Avenue. Ellsworth Avenue, would that be a reference to something? Well, it's a city in the UK. I don't know, superhero shows got me spoiled on thinking every street sign is a reference to something. Good job, Ben. He learned to open the window this time. He's like, there's no way I'm gonna have to rebuild the wall again. That shit took forever. Nice kinetic phase shield. Maybe it's red and silver to indicate that it's a type of text. I guess the color coding does matter. Yeah, it seems we're truly back to the dark atmosphere again. Like, everything's so dark it starts to blend together. Might as well be throwing these coins into the abyss. I'm not even sure if they bothered putting something here and turned down the lighting, or if they just said, yeah, this is just a pure black screen. Ship? Again with the car? Yeah, but even after all that, it seems fine. I feel like I haven't used the Kevin's car counter in forever, which makes me want to use it, but it just hasn't been coming up. <laughs> Also, it seems that this device taps into ship's magnetic properties. I wonder if there's a strong enough magnet that could do the same to upgrade himself. Man, look at Ben take his sweet time getting there. Oh, okay. Alright, that definitely counts. There we go. So I guess they just forgot to draw it all damage those first couple of shots. <sighs> Making the wrong move though, Ben. Should be flying after Morton. Oh, look, check this out. When he transforms back and it turns light, there is an actual background here. All these stones, this railway, and then... Why did they even bother drawing it? He took my pet! Ship? How long has ship been dropping by? You said you didn't want anything to do with ship. Which makes no sense. I feel like ship's like the coolest thing out there. Hell, I'd want ship for myself. Be like, sorry, Julie, but he's staying with me. I never said that. Yes, you did. Which must have happened off screen. Last I remember, Ben seemed pretty okay with ship. What about this thing? He's yours now. Are you gonna keep him? Great! So much for bonding. In fact, it was Len Uli who also wrote Peer Pressure. So I guess he gets the final say, but I wasn't picking up that Ben didn't like ship until this episode. How fast can you get us home? Hey, can you hurry it up? You know how to fly. I always love that little gag. This guy right here has a pretty similar car to Kevin. <clears throat> Now this background right here, I remember from Save the Last Dance, so now we've seen an example of what a background looks like purely painted, and then when they add all the darkness filters to it. There's gotta be some way to find him. It's a new housing development. I was gonna say, this castle didn't look like their other castle that we've seen a few times, but I wasn't sure if it was just a different angle or not. But now I feel validated in knowing that this wasn't the same place from the start. Although if the newspaper is marketing this place as something that anybody can get, what about the secret lab that's below it? Did they dig that themselves, or does it come with the property? You will stay here. Ships my pet. I want to help and you can't stop me. This seems a little bit stubborn of Julie because she's obviously outclassed by everybody here and pretty much has nothing to offer when rescuing ship. But I'm not gonna lie, if someone stole Mochi or Bruce from me, you bet your ass there's not a damn thing you could do that could stop me from going after them. So rock on, Julie. Go get ship. Great, guys. Way to support. I mean, they are supporting, but they're supporting Julie here. <laughs> All right, yeah, like this. See, there's like all these bricks and everything, all this lining. They got a light right up here that somebody would have had to install. Was that newspaper like Bad Guy Hangouts Monthly or something? Who built this? <laughs> they have a surprising amount of things that can handle a galvanic mechamorph. Oh, that's a nice transition going from his eye to the stoplight. Everyone feels so awkward from that little argument in the garage. Except Kevin, he's just eyes on the road. You don't know what you're dealing with. And who obviously does not trust me. This isn't about trust. I mean, it is a little bit at this point. I mean, Ship's not a new thing anymore. Julie's clearly developed a relationship with this creature. And Julie and Ship have had many interactions together to show that Ship isn't actually harmful. I get that he's paranoid and worried about Julie's safety, but it's like he doesn't want to see any other version of this argument but his own. Which
which is good. As much as I praise Alien Force Ben for being mature and level-headed, he still does have some flaws. But at least this isn't coming out of annoyance or ignorance, and it's more dealt from concern. See, this is how you build conflict without it being annoying. Mind if we discuss this later? See, that's still pretty level-headed. He wants to finish the conversation, but doesn't want to argue in front of Kevin and Gwen. Mostly just because that's, like, hella inappropriate. So while, yeah, Ben is in the wrong in this situation, it's not coming from a place of malevolence. I bet this probably would have looked cool if we could see it. Oh, this is like a whole, like, apartment complex. We got center blocks to represent that it's still being built, but they got many castles already built, even up there. Can you imagine living in a place like this? I feel like that'd be way too fancy for me. I, could, I wouldn't be able to handle it. That's not a sound that Stone should make. Is it time to bust the door down yet? Even Kevin realizes how many times he does that. <laughs> Man, I'm really loving Kevin in this episode. He's just so desensitized from the missions that he might as well enjoy himself on the way. What? I was thirsty. What the hell are these things? These aren't their laser lances or their hokey pokies, you know? All right, so they shoot electricity. But I don't know if this is a layering error or something, but these things clearly seem to be making contact with Kevin. But Gwen's forming a shield behind him, yet it protects them. I'm pretty sure that Kevin is supposed to be behind this shield because the way that the lightning is drawn here clearly looks like impacts on a shield that isn't there yet and then a shield that's behind Kevin. All right, so it's cool that Julie has a weapon now, but you're asking a lot to get me to believe she has the strength to whack this guy hard enough for him to drop his weapon. He's in full armor. It's a lot like tennis, actually. Shit, maybe I should start playing tennis. I love this little mini one-shot sequence of Ben trying to use his Omnitrix. Looks really nice. Gwen, gonna wrap this up? Oh, don't, don't do that. Don't do that, because now it's like, why doesn't she do that all the time? They can't keep introducing these OP moves literally once. You know how many times they've pretended they've been surrounded if Gwen could just do this? We're ship. Ships like, now that I'm under Tim Curry's control, I have to sound menacing. These things have to be pretty accurate because the way the ship's levitating up and down, it has to make sure that it stays parallel with whatever it's targeting at, or else the beams themselves would be going up and down as well. Which they are at point A, but point B where it makes contact of where it was shooting isn't. So I'm just saying, I appreciate that little detail. Looks like an Antarian obliterator. A Tarian obliterator? Like this whole thing is one? I thought the knights just slapped together some shit and just said, yeah, this is our big gun. Maybe like one of these is an Atarian obliterator or whatever, but this is clearly just some random an assortment of weapons put together. This isn't, this isn't anything. Galvin Disruptor Pod, Cassiopeian Mass Driver. Whoa, whoa, what? Cassiopeian Mass Driver. Cassiopeian, like the Cassiopeian Dream Eaters? That's not around to late Ultimate Alien, but maybe they just thought the Cassiopeian adjective sounded cool and they just use it every now and then. That thing's a flying arsenal. <laughs> not a single one of those guns can land a shot. Unless that ship, like, subconsciously trying to make sure they don't get hurt. I just feel like visually it'd be better if, like, they were shooting at Gwen's shields or if Ben turned into Humongousaur and blocked them. But the fact that it can't even keep up with them jumping out of the way, I don't know. I feel like that just takes all the hype they built for it and just tosses it aside. There we go. Now it's making some contact. Gwen! And hey, it decommissioned Gwen. Or at least the force that Gwen needed to deflect that beam was enough to make her pass out. Either way, it's something. I'm not saying I'm rooting for ship to, like, murder them. If you're gonna hype something up like crazy and then show that it can't even aim, it's, it's like, am I expected to believe it's actually threatening? <laughs> Y'all ever notice that later on in the transformations, they start speeding them up towards the end? Like, listen to this musical cue. What? They're just rushing through it right now. But hey, it's my boy. It's gotta be hot as hell in there. Hey, that's a good contingency. Shows he's not all just weapons, but has an assortment of different abilities. Stop! It's me! You know, he doesn't seem that large right now, but later on in the future, they all start flying in ship as a vehicle. So perhaps he can make this ship form, but then grow its size as well for whatever's convenient. Which makes me wonder, could he become like a mini ship? That'd be pretty cool if ship was like that whole like flying weapon contraption, but was able to shrink it down and fly alongside Julie like a drone. Don't know what that would be useful for, but it'd be neat. Swampfire's got a green face right here. Yeah, I see it. 
I don't get why Morton's armor is a different color than everyone else's. Maybe it's like he's wearing like the original knight's armor and they're wearing some type of upgraded version. Because Morton does look a little bit more in line with like the classic series Forever Knights. Yes. Not gonna lie, the ship blew my mind the first time. I love that ship actually gets to keep this form. This is one of the coolest things in the show. But it also makes you wonder, so ship's been able to copy the technology he's possessed, correct? Whereas here, it seems like he absorbed it, but then keeps it all within himself, like shrinks down its mass and all of that. Because it doesn't seem like the Forever Knight still has all these weapons. I think Ship just straight up stole them and deconstructed them inside of his body. <laughs> So here Swampfire regrows his severed arm instead of reattaching it like he did in the pilot. It's a really good growing animation though. You can see the red leaves dip down and eventually become his fingers. Then you see these leaves shift over here. Oh, they fly in it right now. Well, look at that. Oh snap, here it is during the daytime. Actually looks a lot less impressive. In fact, it looks like they didn't even finish whatever was gonna go on over here. Oh man, those those explosions <laughs> do not look imposed that well. This is this is very rough. We've had some fantastic explosion animation in Alien Force, so this sticks out pretty horribly. Also, blue jets for ship. You'd think it'd be green. Oh. Down, boy. We have our own spaceship. I can see some uh, pixel deterioration from the way they cut the roof on right here. Maybe that's why they keep the backgrounds dark. Find me a ball and we can play catch. Now Ship's got his ship form, which was the main point of this episode, I believe. So the plot of this, I can only give it to. First few episodes of season two got me so hyped up that I thought it was gonna be a clean ride through, but a lot of these middle stories really don't have the same vibe as the beginning and end episodes. This one, I honestly don't even have much to say. A lot of it is because this sets up another piece of a puzzle that's never gonna come to fruition, as the whole point of Ship's existence was to combat the dragon planet, which once season three rolls around, this just never comes up again. I do like that it elaborates on the relationship between Julie and Ship, and while I was disappointed that she didn't immediately have him as a pet, I do think it makes sense that they'd have to build up to a situation where Ship's around Julie all the time, whereas right now he just runs off and does his own thing but comes back to Julie because he misses her, like a stray cat or dog pretty much. And while I don't really understand why Ben doesn't like Ship, it doesn't even feel like they had a valid reason for it. It's like they were trying to allude to one that should be obvious, but it's not. You can kind of fill in the blanks and be like, oh, Ship is mysterious and dangerous but we've never given evidence to believe so, and normally Ben's pretty rational about that stuff. But nonetheless, the idea of Julie being involved is probably what amplified his paranoia, so I get that he wants to be extra careful, especially when he's dating someone who doesn't have any powers whatsoever. So while I disagree with it, and I don't think it was laid out clear, I guess you could say it makes sense. And I'm not gonna lie, I keep trying to come up with things to talk about with the Knights, but this was just another Forever Knights ploy. They barely felt like a factor in this episode, but this episode did what it needed to to give ship his battle mode, and with serving that purpose, I guess it's alright. Characterization, I'll actually give it a 4. Like I said, I don't have a problem with Ben not agreeing with ship. I do think it's important to continuously point out that this character is flawed. If Ben was like a cookie cutter perfect human being, he would just be flat out boring. And I think you need these other views and these challenges that he has on what everybody else thinks in order to keep his character realistic. And I love that Julie never took shit from Ben this whole episode. People give Julie a lot of flack, but it's just because she's stands up for herself, and when she sees something that she wants or thinks is right, she is determined to make it happen. Whereas us as the audience, we see the main trio as the moral core, and thus all characters challenging them are deviations from the status quo. Julie was totally right in this episode, and I like that they played her off as a strong character, and she wasn't passive about her feelings at all, like she went into that car and said, I'm going. And I respect her a lot for that. And when Ship was about to shoot them all, she walked right up to him, and it is very cliche to do the whole, I know you're in there sort of thing. But I see it more as giving Julie a chance to shine as a character and show that she can be just as brave as the main trio. Sir Morton and Chadwick are fun characters to have on screen. They're much more entertaining when they show back up in Omniverse. But aside from them being entertaining, they're just, you know, forever knights. Visual, sadly, it's gonna get a one. There really was not a lot happening in this episode. And while ship's battle mode is cool, that alone isn't strong enough to give this episode any more points than I am right now. You know, the atmosphere was too dark to appreciate anything. Thing. The action scenes were pretty weak. There wasn't a lot happening in between the major beats of the story. It's just, it didn't have it. But yeah, Ship's Battle Mode was cool. It's kind of iconic in the Ben 10 series, especially because it's got a very unique shape. 
it's not just a straight up spaceship. And seeing Ship himself turn into all those other little things is always a treat to see. Importance, I'm only going to give it a three. Like I said, the only real thing this episode has going for it is it introduces Ship's battle mode. And while it is kind of important to see because it does show back up throughout the UAF era, if you did miss it, it's not crazy important to understand exactly where he gets it from. In the grand scheme of all the arcs and plots and character development of Ben 10, I can't really rank seeing this episode just to make sure you know where Ship's ship form comes from. So upon editing this, I realized I completely forgot to talk about the entertainment category. Originally, I was going to give it a 2, but the fact I even forgot about to talk about the entertaining parts and, you know, reevaluating the episode as I edit it, it really only deserves a 1. It's just... It's not that good. So that's gonna leave us off with an 11 out of 25. We got one more episode to go through, so let's wrap this up. Our final episode today, Unearthed, had first aired March 24th, 2009, written by Charlotte Fullerton. When mining quartz crystals, some DNA aliens accidentally find a ship deeply buried in the Earth, which releases an alien creature that was asleep through cryogenics. The creature wanders around Bellwood, collecting mysterious objects, and the trio soon find out that this creature is actually a baby and they must find a way to return it to where it comes from. <laughs> This right here pretty much gives away that it's a child off the bat, since there's one that's visibly much smaller than two others, which you can deduce must be the parents. A quartz crystal mine. I forgot we actually got to see one of these. It is not one of our ships, sir. So with this DNA alien calling the other one sir, I guess there's some type of DNA alien hierarchy. The hybrid designate one DNA alien to look after the others when they're not around. I don't think we've heard something like that before, or if it even comes up after this episode. And our first look at Tiny. Not sure if the skin here is actually supposed to be black or if it's like the very dark black shading that sometimes shows up in Ben 10. Like the rocks on Alan do it is another great example. But it's an effect we don't see very often in Ben 10. Like it's not consistent enough for it to look like signature to its art style. Unlike say the Supernatural anime series for example. I don't know why that's the first one that comes to mind but that's the series where it utilizes just pure black shading enough for it to become a signature to their style. Whereas in Ben 10 it's not done off enough where you have to think about it and this could easily be confused with like a mask or something. We're pretty deep into the Alien Force breakdowns. Uh, at this point, I don't want to keep pointing out the moon, but here's just another example where they use the exact same moon for a background. And of course, it's a full moon. You know, with the wide open desert and then this cliff elevated pretty high, this looks like the same area that Albedo lures Ben to in the final battle part one to show off his old matrix. Yo, it actually is. I can't believe I made that connection. But in the Albedo episode, this train track right here is more complete, showing a subtle passage of time. <laughs> Now we're hearing that DNA alien speak again, which they randomly alternate between doing that in English. The coupling's missing. It's been a bit since I pointed out some fantastic smoke animation, but this is a top tier example right here, especially since the creature has to push through it. I was gonna say blows the smoke animation from Pet Project out the water, but they're not even in the same leagues. Go now! That sounded like Jeff Bennett, so he must be somebody else important in this episode too. Tiny's dad. Yep, alright. I was gonna say, Jeff Bennett's usually not hired just for strictly background work. <laughs> oh man, there goes all their stuff. It's very unfortunate. I like that we're actually seeing the middle ground between the desert and Bellwood. Usually they're two completely different terrains, but not often we see the city and the desert overlap in the same shot. It's like when the trio goes to the desert, they're just randomly in a desert area for miles. You can already kind of tell that this creature is harmless just off of its expressions and its interactions with everything. Like this smile right here gives it all away. Not that it's really supposed to be a secret, but I like that they're not trying to make Tiny seem super scary and terrifying just to throw you off. You can kind of say they did a little bit here with the family, but it wasn't really to a point where I felt like this family was in danger. Tiny just wanted this little carriage thing. I love whenever Gwen levitates. Sometimes she floats out with the object when tracking it, and sometimes she's in the car with Kevin. Maybe it depends on how strong the aura is that she's tracking. Or like if it's a weaker aura, she's got to be outside the vehicle for a stronger connection to it or something. Mana trail is getting stronger and stronger. You said that like two hours ago, Gwen. Yeah, see, she's having trouble tracking it down, so getting out of the car and floating with it probably gives her a boost. It could be a bear that escaped from the zoo. No reports of missing animals from any zoo in the entire state. It's smart that they checked, too. They're not just blindly being like, well, it has to be an alien. They already covered all of the basic ground. There it is. 
so its skin is sensitive enough to be affected by the prickles of a cactus. That's unfortunate. This thing looks like it would be as sturdy as Humongousaur. <laughs> I guess I was wrong. Doesn't really care. Ooh, man, I feel bad for the guy that has to keep drawing all the stuff in the carriage every single time. Drop it! Alright, that that's a little adorable. Not very DNA alien. That looks like hybrid tech. Maybe he's working for them. Which is a valid assumption. I mean, we just had Simeon working for the hybrid, and he's not a DNA alien. Build with all that stuff. So I guess Tiny's a bit territorial. But Ben's always pulling out these crazy flips and dodges. Really gotta admire his athleticism. This pose right here makes him look straight out of an anime. Yeah. And Kevin just punched a baby in the face. <laughs> So mesmerized by the sudden transformation. You know, I used to think they have very similar builds, but it's more of just their silhouette. You can see with their joints and their folds and everything, they actually do have very different details from each other. I think he loves you. Yeah, this is more of a hug than an attack. Oh. Oh my gosh. What a powerful punch. I loved this fixed camera sliding with it. All of this from one hit, too. Ben's never even hit a DNA alien in this heart before. I didn't hit you that hard. Seems like his voice filter is gone again after its brief return and grounded. That one was a little high and inside. I'm sorry I just blew you off like that. I didn't hit you that hard. But I'm a little distracted by the fact they use the exact same background when it cuts back to Tiny. Like, look at the stars. Hit you that hard. <laughs> See, this is supposed to be a totally different angle. And yet between these two shots, the background's exactly the same. They could have at least flipped it or something. He's going for a weapon! Jeez, Kevin, what are you, a cop? <laughs> Getting away. I mean, to be fair, they've never actually encountered an alien baby before, and I have no reason to think this would be otherwise, but just watching all of this, knowing what it really is, it's like, damn, just leave the creature alone. Feel bad. Leave you guys alone for five minutes. Why did she, though? Like, what was she doing this whole time? <laughs> So Tiny can see Gwen's true anodite form. When she does it, though, you can see Humongousaur here in the back. And then after the flash, he is gone. In fact, it's pretty much a completely different background when this happens. Yeah, that does look bad, but if they just took a second to realize that this monster isn't actually attacking them, just trying to subdue them. But again, yeah, I know they've they've just never been in this situation before, so it's probably not even crossing their minds that this is a possibility. Put her down! Speaking of the deep black shadows, it happens underneath Kevin's chin and his eye hood sometimes. Not every time, though, but sometimes. Also when he's in his metal form, too, so I guess it shows up a little, a little bit more often than ultra rare occasions, but still, I wouldn't say it's like a sick signature of the UAF art style. Put me down! Now! So this is us as the audience first hearing Gwen's anodite voice. Do you think that might be done for us, or do you think Tiny's actually hearing Gwen's voice all distorted and magical like this too? Put me down! Now! Thank you. I think it's just a baby! You can faintly hear like little baby maraca sounds when this thing is spinning. What makes you think it's a girl? You didn't pay much attention in health class, did you? Well, that's one way to say something without saying something. We can't really be wasting time babysitting this thing. She needs our help. So this rock here is just shaded with a gradient. It doesn't have the background texture or the cell shading of what characters and important objects are normally having when animated. This is like a, a compromise. Come on, Gwen. We're on a mission. This creature has nothing to do with that. So now we're getting the exact opposite thing that we got in Birds of a Feather. Gwen wants to help out this creature that they just met, and Ben's trying to argue that they shouldn't. Hey, Ben, remember the time that you said, Well, it's in my interest to help anybody who needs it. So you're going to help one of the hybrid whose entire purpose right now is to wipe out all life in the galaxy, but you're gonna turn your back on an innocent baby? This is why it's always bothersome when they make characters try to speak the opposite point of view just for the sake of an argument. It just makes these people seem sporadically out of character. If anything, I would say make Kevin the one who doesn't want to help it, but Ben? Based on everything we know about Ben and the way he's acted so far, there's no way he'd turn his back on anyone, especially an innocent baby. But here he is right now just being like, fuck that kid. <laughs> The creature has our power I think it's funny that these DNA aliens probably didn't expect to travel, so they have to use their mining carts to move around. <laughs> Not exactly sure what happened here, but it must be a new trick that she learned since being covered in goo is something that frequently happens to the team. She's probably learned some contingencies for that. Looking for this? <laughs> Better split up. So Ben's bright idea is to bring the power source towards them. I would have had these three Echo Echoes keep doing what they're doing, but this one should be hightailing it out of there. 
<laughs> this is the same Echo Echo animation copy and pasted. I'm not saying it's wrong for them to, you know, save time and all that. But I always like being able to catch it. Thanks, guys! You're talking to yourselves again. Alright, this is kind of cool. Echo Echo starts lighting up and glowing, allowing all of these Echo Echoes to jump in, and they're transparent with after images. A slight variation of the effect we've seen before, but this is presented ever so slightly different. Although it looks like Ben's transformation bubbles start affecting the power core too, when it should just be Echo Echo. Oh, when he transforms back, Ben's holding it. But he wasn't even holding it as Echo Echo. It's like the Omnitrix knew to like levitate it into Ben's hands somehow. About that. Her. Whatever. Come on, Ben. Pro notes aren't that hard to learn. Get with the times. Back at Kevin's garage. <laughs> Maybe bringing it back here wasn't a good idea. I would have brought it back to like La Soledad or something. All right, so while editing this, I realized that the D and Aliens and Hybrid are all occupying La Soledad currently, so they actually couldn't bring it to La Soledad. But they didn't even try. That probably would have turned into a whole other thing, but it's like, I feel like there were better places to bring it than Kevin's garage. Hell, just stay out in the desert. Her. Hey, see, Ben caught on there you go do i look like i care ah oh, come on kevin don't be that guy what are you doing there was so much pain in kevin's voice right there what are you doing the level of concern that kevin's has for his car will always amuse me for this one random frame ben's jaw comes detached from the rest of his face barely noticeable but even in motion you can kind of see it flicker when much as i hate yeah right there <laughs> I don't think she can see so well in the sunlight anyway. Well, how would you know? You guys are never in the sunlight to begin with. Why, well, it only rampaged at night. She. Hey, there we go. Now everybody's on board. Take that, bigots. Tonight we'll get Tiny to lead us to wherever she came from. <laughs> So now Tiny is deliberately attacking all these D and aliens when before it was either in self-defense or just being playful. Tiny is progressively being drawn a lot more angular throughout this episode too, and a little bit more simplified. Look. Same with the Echo Echo, these D and aliens are all the same animation. And of course we got a red and silver color scheme for this thing. Guard the door. Were you inside the stasis pod? And she just knows those are stasis pods. <laughs> Oh snap, Chroma Stone looks freaking awesome right here. We pretty much get a different effect for Chroma Stone with his powers every single time. Be it different studios or there's just no straight up guide for this. But I like this. This looks a lot better than some of the other effects we've gotten him. It's also very colorful too. <laughs> That was pretty awesome. He's got the circumference of beams that shoot out and it gets all of them. Every single one of them. Loving all these little mini impact explosions as well. This one's got some like heated plasma shooting out of his chest. Well that guy's not getting cured back to a human. Yeah, this is a pretty great episode for Chroma Stone. Kind of funny how Tiny can withstand the harsh impact of the D and Aliens' is drilling laser, but the cactus hurts it. Tiny only has resistance to burning damage, but not piercing. Just a random thought, but I would have loved for there to be an episode dealing with the moral struggle of fighting the D and Aliens, knowing that they're humans. You kind of get that in War of the Worlds when they decide to create the DNA curing guns. Had they not made those guns, they still would have been kicking their ass pretty hard. It would have been interesting if there was an episode where the whole time they were trying to find different efficient solutions of fighting the DNA aliens without actually having to fight them and none of them ended up working out so they realized that unfortunately they have to like treat them as full-on targets in order to do what they have to do we've known for well over a season now that these are all actually humans so freaking dropping rocks on them and shit like no tomorrow you gotta think like this has to weigh on their moral compass in some form a a burger shack sign now this door opening was animated with the background texture and it looks pretty good. <laughs> Kinda wish they had slightly different appearances. Omniverse would have been able to do something well with that. Although I wouldn't want them to look like so distinctly feminine and masculine. I like that they visually look ambiguous with their gender. It's just like, you know, giving them different traits. Maybe this one's got spots and this one has different patterns for their plating. It's not 1952? There was a time machine experiment that year. It must have affected your ship's engine. You know, I'm surprised that these creatures can even identify what 1952 is. I don't know if it's like coming out as 
1952 to them through their translators or whatever. But 1952 is strictly Earth chronological documentation. But I love that this is tying into Paradox right now. Because Paradox isn't strictly like a D and Alien episode. But it's like now his episode is even more relevant outside of just the introduction of the character. Because it also connects to this one. Imagine what anyone would need this much crystal quartz for. Maybe a teleporter grid? Pretty big foreshadowing too because that's exactly what they use it for. <laughs> so I've been waiting to mention this because I wasn't sure if the episode was going to explain it or not, but why does Tiny see Gwen's true anodite form? I don't know, it's neat, but it's like a bit random. This is something I feel should have a solid explanation, especially since it's the audience's first introduction to Gwen's anodite form as well. I mean, granted, it does look exactly like Verdona's, but you know, it, it matters. You can't keep earthlings need to roam free. It's funny that the trio were speaking about Tiny as if they were still somewhat a wild animal, and now Tiny's parents are doing that about the trio. Oh, that's sweet. Tiny should have came back at some point in the future. They could have had a whole episode about all of, like, the, the adolescent creatures. Like, an episode with Tiny, Big Chill's kids, Ship, and Zed, and they all go off on, like, their own adventure. I have no idea what would have happened, but I'm sure they would have thought of something neat, especially if it was done during Omniverse. <laughs> Still mulling our way through these mid-season episodes. So for the plot of this, it's gonna get a two. Same commentary as a lot of the episodes in this video. It's just a mediocre story, but it's missing that special Ben 10 flavor. It does make the hybrid arc lore a little bit deeper, but not by much and nothing significant. A lot of the story beats seemed very by the books and it's all very passable. There's nothing I really disliked about this episode or hated. It's just a very basic story, not even just for Ben 10, but shows in general. And I don't think they did something special Special with it enough to make it worth being a Ben 10 episode. Characterization, I'll give it a 3. Characters were more or less in line with each other. There was that one moment where Ben was kind of hesitant on helping Tiny, and while he did get over that quickly, the fact that he was hesitant in the first place is just a bit too obviously plot forced to really be something that Ben would say. Like, I mean, come on, there's no way he would think twice about helping Tiny, but someone had to just to strengthen the narrative that Gwen cares about this creature, I guess. But yeah, I mean, there were some funny jokes in here. A lot of them, I'm sure won't make the cut when I'm editing this breakdown so you know go back and watch it and it's pretty humorous and of course it was pretty great that Paradox's episode tied into this a little bit the fact that his time machine is what disrupted their cryo sleep I just think that's pretty neat but yeah overall it was it was all right visuals I'm only gonna throw a two at it though there were some selective shots that were animated nicely especially chromostone but compared to episodes like good copy bad copy birds of a feather and grounded the animation wasn't as spectacular as we've seen before, and there wasn't enough happening for something to be extravagantly animated in the first place. And you know, at this point, the D and Alien fights are just becoming like clockwork. They shoot some goo, they gotta deflect from the goo, and then they pummel the D and Aliens. By now, I would have liked to start seeing more creativity with the fights, but yeah, a 2 is the best I can give this. Now, importance, it's gonna get a 1 for the same reasons as all the others that got a 1 in this video. There's a sliver of info that adds on to the hybrid arc that if you did watch it, it just makes the finale pay off a little bit better. Better, but it's so insignificant and skippable that ranking it any higher than a 1 would be foolish. But it still has something, so it's not quite a 0. And entertaining, I can give it a 2. A very passable episode. It was neat seeing Gwen's anodite form which you think would rank up the importance to this more, but actually not seeing this makes the reveal in the season two finale that much more epic. And we never get a reason why Tiny can see Gwen in her anodite form, so it's not even that revolutionary. That leaves Unearthed off at a 10 out of 25. Now it's time to wrap things up. So I just got some random final thoughts to say that I thought of while I was editing. For one, yeah, I'm still bitching about Simeon. If he didn't die, it would have at least been neat for there to be some type of consequence. We do literally hear the DNA alien ear cleaner go off. <laughs> and we've seen the result of what happens when it's activated. So something would have had to have happened, right? If anything, I think it would have been neat that when Simeon comes back, he's missing an arm or something. How the hybrid intended to kill him, but he managed to escape, but not without consequence. Also, all of the transformations in Birds of a Feather have a zooming out of the eye effect when Ben first transforms into them, aside from Jet Ray, who transforms directly out of Big Chill. The aliens in the episode Grounded are the exact same ones that appeared in Ben 10 Returns Part 1. 
1 and 2, even in the same order that they appeared. Also, in the title card for that, I accidentally put the year 2009 instead of 2008. Going back and forth on the airing order makes the years a little bit confusing, but that part of the video was already finished, so I couldn't change it. And lastly, the first two episodes where Ship is prominent, Peer Pressure, and Pet Project, are alliteration with the letter P. Just something neat. I'd also like to cover the last poll we had, in which we decided which version of Cooper that most people favored. Surprisingly, Ultimate Alien won. Now, I actually agree with this, I really do like Ultimate Alien Cooper the most, just something about defying the tech guy stereotype is very appealing to me, plus I feel like Cooper purposefully made himself look a little bit like Kevin in order to get with Gwen, that's something I'd buy that he would do. But I honestly thought I was in the minority, and most people did prefer the shorter, chubbier Cooper, who is more in line with what you would expect with the stereotypical tech guy. But it's nice to see my opinions validated by the community, however, if you still like the other versions of Cooper, all the power to you. I'm just saying I'm shocked that this many people actually agreed with me on this one. That's all I got for this video. For this week's poll, it's gonna be simple, which episode of these four did you like more? Let me know in the community tab when this video goes live. I hope you all have a fantastic weekend, and I hope to see you at the 5YL anniversary stream. And until then, keep it fizzy.